G'day viewers. So, um, this is a quick little reply video to Matt Easton's most recent missive on quarter starves. Um, now, despite the fact that Matt more or less talks common sense most of the time these days, um, in this case he's talking rot, and this is a little quick video to explain why. So first of all, what was a quarter staff? Um, historically speaking, uh, we're told that it was a stout pole between seven and nine feet long, depending on the master, depending on personal preference and your stature, of course. Um, traditionally, people say it was made of oak. Um, Wilde says it was preferably ash. Um, and they're usually described as being iron shod or tipped with iron or with pikes. So spikes, which is the term that Swetnam uses. Um, so much like the sort of ends that you get on the bottom of contemporary pole arms, like in the antique sword video we did the other week. Now, if you make an eight foot stick out of oak or ash and stick some iron shodding on it, you realize that this is not just a stick, this is a serious weapon. Um, I'm also going to mention that perhaps 25 years ago I came across a reference in a book about medieval forestry that described how they made quarterstaves, uh, which was more or less the same way they made longbows, just bigger. And as a result they came out not exactly round, they were slightly oval and slightly tapered. Um, that reference is, I never wrote it down and it's long gone. Uh, so I'll just mention that in case somebody out there might actually have a reference to the slightly oval, slightly tapered method of making quarter starves. I'd be really keen to know. But in any case, it was a serious weapon. Um, what did it do? It killed people. It killed people a lot. Um, for instance, in Nottinghamshire, between uh, 14... 85 and 1558, there were 103 reported murders. Cortisarves were responsible for 53 of them. Swords were only responsible for nine. So cortisarves killed people. How did they kill people? They killed people mostly by bashing in their heads. We have an account here of a typical such incident. Um, so this is from 1527. Uh, where on the 4th of September, John, John Stringer, late of Babworth, labourer, assaulted Henry Pearson of Babworth with a staff worth one shilling, which he held in both hands, striking him on top of the head so that his brains flowed out and giving him a wound one inch deep, two inches wide and three inches long, of which he immediately died. So basically, a proper quarter staff could kill you with one solid blow to the head. We're going to have a look at exactly what sort of blow that might have been a little later in the video. Um, now Matt says, well, you wouldn't necessarily carry a quarter stuff around like a walking stick. Well, not exactly true. You might not carry it around town per se, but you definitely carry it around the countryside. Um, there's lots and lots and lots of medieval and later people, not just pilgrims, just ordinary people walking around with great big sticks, uh, six, seven, eight foot staves, crooks, staves, whatever you want to call them. Um, and you might think that's a little excessive, but I was on a sort of medieval weekend once in a place that was quite steep, quite muddy, and it rained a lot, and, and it was in a pine forest. And I used every single inch of my eight foot quarter staff just to stay upright. So you might think it's a little bit of an overkill for a walking stick, but in the right conditions, um, absolutely practical and people would have just, yes, carried them around. The next question is about the lethality of a quarter staff. Um, now Matt says, well, yes, if you get a solid blow to the head, it's gonna ruin your day. But if it hits you anywhere else on the body, you're probably not going to be immediately disabled. Now, that's actually pretty well true. Silver says so. Silver says that, and here it is to be noted, that if you fight well, the staff man never striketh but at the head and thrusteth presently under at the body. So Silver agrees. Silver says, yes, if you've got a quarter staff and you're striking a blow, you hit them on the head, okay? 
if you want to hit them anywhere else, you thrust. And a thrust with a quarter staff is absolutely devastating. Okay, even without the iron shotting, which of course turns it more or less into something like a spear. A thrust with a, a piece of wood, it's not going to flex, it's not going to bend, it's just going to land an enormous amount of force on a very small um, surface area. Um, and with an eight foot stick, you can thrust somebody in the foot or the knee while remaining completely and utterly outside reach of a sword or any other weapon that they might be carrying. Um, a thrust to the solar plexus, to the chest or to the face is going to be utterly devastating and completely knock people down just through sheer blunt force trauma. Um, even in the 19th century where they're using relatively light uh, bamboo or rattan staffs, they still say a thrust with an eight foot staff will easily crack a rib even through the protective armour that they were wearing. So yes, blows were aimed at the head and really only the head is going to cause serious amounts of damage. Um, everywhere else you thrust and it's the staff thrust that really fills it out as a as a effective weapon of self-defense against pretty well anything. Um, now, all the historical masters all say staves are better in single combat than anything else. Okay, Silver says so with the one exception of something called a Welsh hook, which um, I'll show you one at the end of the video just so you know what it looks like. Um, it's basically a quarter staff with lots of spikes on the end. Um, otherwise, Swetnam says it's better than everything else. Wild says, for a man that rightly understands it, he may bid defiance and laugh at any other weapon. And McBain, and really nobody did this stuff for real more than McBain. McBain says, whoever is master of the staff may defend himself against any one man with back or small sword, as has often been experienced. Okay, so the guys who did it for real were absolutely convinced the staff was a better weapon in single combat than anything else. Um, the idea that you could perhaps stick your arm in the way, let alone a sword, um, and parry the thing is frankly a bit ridiculous. Um, we'll do a little bit of a test of that later where I will swing a quarter staff at somebody with a back sword and see if they can parry it in any way whatsoever. So let's have a quick look at some actual quarter staffs, okay? This one is oak, this one is ash. The ash is ever so slightly lighter than the oak but they're both more or less the same, about two and a half kilos or five pounds each. Now, you'll notice that this one has been shod with iron, so it has a steel cone on each end, um, which if it was a big walking stick would help protect it against the ground, um, and for fighting purposes, obviously, make the thrusts a little bit more devastating. This one I've had made with that slight oval section I was telling you about earlier, which certainly gives it a, a feeling that it's got some kind of an edge to it. Um, now behind me on the stack of chairs is a pumpkin um, and for many, many decades the Australian Army has been using the Queensland Blue Pumpkin as a rough and red, ready substitute for a human head for ballistics trials. Um, it's a fairly tough pumpkin. So we're going to use this as a target just to see what a staff could do to a head if it's wielded properly. Okay, here we go. A blow for the staff. Let's see what sort of damage we did. So, as you can see, we've actually cracked the pumpkin all the way up there, all the way down there, and down that side there. So that blow down on top of the pumpkin basically just cracked it into segments. Uh, so this is a lot tougher than any human head I'm aware of. 
um, and that one blow, even on something that's only semi-supported, still did an enormous amount of damage. Um, let's put a live target in the way and see what they think about the strength of various ways that I can strike them with a quarter staff. So, are you ready to be targeted? I'm ready to be targeted. Okay, so I'm going to just deliver a down right blow. That's a down left blow there. How was that? That felt very strong. Okay. Right through the shield. Right through the shield. Once and off. Right through the shield. Alright, put the shield up on top of your head. Like so? Like so. Okay, so this sort of action, sort of thing you normally use as a riposte in a star fight against the sword guy, I can use it as an initial attack. Oh god, wow. <laughs> Very much so. Once more. Tuck your chin, <laughs> So how does that feel in power compared to the other one? It's uh, mind-numbingly overbearing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so finally the thrust, so just get the shield up there. Okay, a normal thrust seal, which I would definitely use against a sword guard. Pretty strong. Pretty strong. Oh, really okay, or a thrust where I'm actually holding onto the start. And you pull that too, just a little bit. And because it's not, it doesn't work late on me. So Lloyd there had a shield, you know, basically for his own protection so I could hit him kind of hard um, and see what it felt like. Um, what if you have a sword that you can put in the way, let alone an arm? Can you actually parry a staff blow? Well, Silver says no. Silver says that the blow being strongly made at the head upon that ward will beat down the ward and his head together and put him in great danger of his life. Let's see if Silver was right. Okay, hold it up in terms of open ward. <laughs> I'd rather not. <laughs> So, you've seen that really a back sword is completely incapable of stopping a staff blow. So what if I am surrounded by more than one person with a sword, um, such as Richard Peek was? So this is the story that Matt alluded to. Um, Richard Peek's three to one, where Peek claims to have been captured by the Spanish. Um, and they wanted to test his martial prowess basically to see what sort of resistance they might meet should they invade England. Um, and he embarrassed them by beating them. And so, because he was being a bit cocky, they said, all right, how many of us are you prepared to fight at once? And he said, any number under six, so long as I am armed with my own country's weapon, that is a quarter staff. So they found some sort of halberd, they took the head off, they gave it to him as an improvised quarter staff and set him up against three Spanish rapiermen and he beat them all in fairly short order and the Spanish were so impressed they let him go. That's peak story. No reason to really think it isn't true. Now, here's the interesting thing. Look at the picture on the front of Peak's book. So, did you notice how Peak is holding his quarter staff? He's not holding it in a recognised quarter staff ward. He's not using the low ward or the high ward. He's not closing a line. He's not presenting the point. He's holding the staff horizontally with his hand stretched out. You know, kind of what looks like a slightly odd position. And in single combat with a staff, it would be a very silly half-assed, half-staffing way of holding the staff. 
But in group combat, just little this little clue of peaks, um, it's utterly brilliant. Okay, by holding the staff like Peak holds it, uh, what you're basically doing is denying any of the opponents that might be surrounding you access to your weapon, but still giving you access to a devastating and really fast thrust single in either direction, plus sweeping blows, plus a really firm parry should you need it. Um, so this is something that I've honestly really only been playing with relatively recently since I realized what it was that Peak was doing. Um, but nonetheless, it works like a treat. So we're going to do a little bit of a demo of what happens if you are surrounded by three swordsmen, you have a quarter staff, and you use it like Peak uses it. Oh, surrounded by three guys. <laughs> to show you what a Welsh hook is. Um, this isn't one, this is Button. Say hello to the world, Button. Ah, oh, you're a beautiful thing. But not quite as beautiful as this. This is a Welsh hook, or a reproduction of one. Um, now, as you can see, even though the head of the thing looks like it was kind of designed by a Klingon in a bad mood, um, this is a really effective weapon. Um, largely because of the amount of metal that's in this head here, which is not very much compared to a normal English bill or a halberd or something like that. It's mounted on what's otherwise a perfectly normal, reasonable quarterstaff. Um, and because the head does not weigh very much, the overall weapon is about the same weight as a quarterstaff. Uh, but you have the added advantage of spikes in pretty well every single direction, which just makes it nastier to deal with. Plus the fact that you've got this gap here that is perfect for catching people's shafts, um, controlling their weapon, sliding up it into their hands, um, and other things like that. So, just in case you were curious, the Welsh Hawk. <laughs> 